Mr. Miller, it's good to see you, sir. How many know Mr. Miller, the president of the CRC in Northeast? Why don't you give him a round of applause? My name is Gus Augustus, and I serve as the director of the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods. And this is, how many people know this young man right here, Dynamite young man? Councilman, Councilman Michael Jo, I mean, uh, <laughs> Brandon Scott. And then we have next to Mr. S next to Councilman Scott, to his left, uh, Councilman Bobby Karen, Robert Karen. And hoping I probably don't call him, uh, Deputy Mayor Robert Maloney, Bob Maloney. Good man. <laughs> Had to call you, Bob. You're sitting on the end. Um, so thanks for coming out tonight. The mayor is making her way in with the commissioner, and she didn't ask me to do this, but won't you give her a round of applause as she comes in and takes her seat? Good evening, everyone. Madam Mayor, normally uh, the format is I stand behind a podium, but this podium is probably about five, five feet, eight inches tall. Uh, so I just stepped from behind the podium uh, uh, so you could see me. Those of you who still have a seat next to you, won't you just raise your hand? And we have a few people coming in. There are still a few seats. All right. Miss Curley, Miss Andrea Curley, why don't you raise your hand for a second? How many of you know Miss Andrea Curley? She's your <laughs> neighborhood liaison. So tonight, as Mark Washington finds a seat, uh, Mark Washington of Chum, won't you give him a round of applause for making it out tonight? <laughs> Coach. <laughs> Code Stream Homestead Montebello. So I know the camera guy wants me to kind of stay still for a second here. How many of you know Officer Joe Banks? Yeah. Officer Banks. <laughs> and congratulations. I understand your family just merged with the men's warehouse. And. Uh, no. <laughs> That's an inside joke between Joe and I. So let us get started. It, it is my honor and privilege to stand before you tonight as the moderator. Uh, I will be introducing both uh, two special presenters as well as a few community leaders who are with us tonight. Uh, tonight uh, is the seventh of a series of public safety forums throughout the city uh, Madam Mayor, a few months ago, promised the residents of the city of Baltimore that she would host a public safety forum in each of the police districts. Uh, this is the seventh, as I just stated, as, and it includes a youth forum that we hosted just a few weeks ago that was exclusively for young people. Tonight, we are in the Northeast District. Northeast District, why don't you put your hands together? Those of you who are <laughs> residents... For if anyone were to ask us who the special guests were tonight, you are tonight's special guests. You are the reason we are here. You are the reason we have jobs, actually. <laughs> um, so tonight, I will introduce uh, the president of the, CR the Northeast CRC, that is the Community Relations uh, Council. None other than, and put your hands together when he comes up and gives a welcome, Mr. Ulysses Miller. Excuse me. I didn't know I was supposed to make a speech. I think when I took public speaking, that was the first thing they said is fear of getting in front of an audience and fear of being unprepared. But uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Northeast District. 
Uh, for those of you that don't know about the council, the council is run by civilians and we represent the whole district. So when there's a problem in the district, we work closely with our major and the police commissioner. Uh, so now we normally have a meeting every third Wednesday of the month at the police station. And it's to update you on certain types of information that we think you need to know to secure uh, your safety in the district. At this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Augustus. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Next up, we have two individuals, two gentlemen. Uh, they happen to be the representatives for the Northeast. Northeast has two council representatives, and they are, well, actually, there are five. No, no, no thank, you, thank you, Councilman. There are actually five, but we have two of the five with us tonight. That is, uh, they are City Councilman Robert, or we call him Bobby Karen, and Councilman Brandon Scott, if you would just <laughs> welcome them. Thank you, Gus, and uh, boy, am I afraid of talking in front of people? I don't know. Uh, well, first of all, I want to welcome the Mayor, Madam Mayor, and Commissioner, and uh, other staff from the uh, Northeast District that are here tonight, um, and all the uh, residents that are here, we're hearing their issues in the next coming uh, hours or so, because we've got a full crowd tonight. I just want to mention uh, thanks to Jeff Matan, the president of Good Sam, for helping us host this tonight. I don't know if Jeff is here. Uh, Good Sam is one of the finest community hospitals, not just in the city, but in the state, Jeff. You've done a, one, do a wonderful job up here as a community hospital. Um, but with that, I'm going to ask my junior member, before he goes into effect for his curfew, he has to get home before curfew, <laughs> but I'm going to ask him to have a couple comments. Good evening, everyone. And if I have to go home, that means he has to go home because he's too, too old to drive anymore. I have to drive him home. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, Madam Mayor, Commissioner, everyone, uh, welcome back to the Northeast District. I've I think I'm very impressed with the crowd that we have here. We know that public safety is the most important thing to us in the Northeast District. And yes, we know that we have, we have issues in our district, but I think that we have the finest district in the city of Baltimore. We have the most organized and the most beautiful neighborhoods with the most beautiful people. We have the best cops in the city of Baltimore. Uh, we can see this because oftentimes the people that are in the Northeast end up going other places and leaving us, like Colonel D'Souza that is there, uh, Commissioner. Please leave Major Worley where he is, please. We don't want everybody in the room being upset. But we have the, yes, they are overworked. Yes, they have more work to do than anybody else. But they are so great that they are able to turn water from wine every day. And the only way they can do that and they continue to do that is partnering with all of us. And I know that all of you will continue to support them. And we all have to support them. So thank you, Mayor, Commissioner, for coming out. And everyone, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. And now certainly not introducing, but to present to you uh, the mayor of this fine city, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Thank you very much, Gus. I wanna thank you all for being here. Before I uh, give my remarks, I've, I've come here so many times, whether it's for the CRC or for community association meetings, and this is the first time I've been here for a community meeting where the president, President Matan, has been here, and I would love to hear from him. You've been, because I've been here so much, I know that uh, Good Sam is an excellent community partner, and I'd, I'd love, as our host, I would love to give you an opportunity to say something and to say thank you for hosting us this evening. Testing. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, for being here, and Commissioner Batts as well. And I'd uh, like to extend my uh, welcome to the community. Good Samaritan Hospital is exceptionally proud uh, to be a community provider, and uh, we take our trust in the community and our service to the community exceptionally seriously, and uh, we enjoy um, being able to provide service and high-quality care to the community, and I welcome you to uh, reach out to us in any way that we can be helpful to continue to be a service to the Northeast District, and I uh, appreciate uh, the Commissioner and the Mayor's time this evening. Thank you all. Thank you very much, and I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. I want to thank Senator Joan Carter-Conway for being here. 
uh, this evening. I want to thank the councilmen uh, both for being here, of course, the CRC president, Mr. Miller, uh, for being here, Mary Pat Clark. We're almost at a quorum. We're almost at a quorum. Uh, city <laughs> move to adjourn. No, we're just getting started. I want to uh, thank the uh, councilman, councilman Mary Pat Clark, for being here. Uh, and I'd, I also want to thank our other community reps who are here, uh, Ms. Corinthia Barber, Mark Washington, and Mr. Wheaton. Thank you all for being here. And I, I, I'm going to try to make it as short as possible because I want to get the, the commissioner to speak and I want to be able to get to the questions. You know why we're here. Uh, my colleagues say all the time, uh, one of my colleagues and Councilman Curran has heard Ricky Spector say, you don't ask the doctor if the medicine is working, you ask the patient. And for me, this these conversations that we're having is about making sure that the relationship that you want to have with the pol police uh, department, the relationship that you want to have with my administration around public safety is one that we've been in communication about. Any relationship you have, if you're not talking about it, you're not getting it right. So I want to be able to talk about it, to figure out what we can do more of, what you have issues with, how we can work better together to have a safer community. My, uh, my, my vision and my strategy around violence reduction is clear. We're going to continue to target on that small group of people, the repeat violent offenders who are causing havoc and terrorizing our community. We're going to continue to do that. We also have a broader strategy. We understand that it's not all, uh, we're not going to arrest our way out of that, this. And if we are going to see a dramatically safer city, we're going to do it in partnership with the community. So that's why we're here. I'm looking forward to getting some questions. I want to thank uh, Don Fry. I see him in the back, the president of the Greater Baltimore Committee. I appreciate the representative from the business community, um, well, m many members of the business community, but particularly uh, Don, I want to thank you. Don has been uh, great for our a higher One Youth Initiative. He takes his role as a, a leader in the business community very seriously and has continued to increase the number of opportunities that we are giving to young people who want to work in private employment opportunities through the summer. So I want to thank you publicly uh, for that, Don, and thank you for being here. And with that, I am going to turn it over for brief remarks from the commission, and then we're going to turn it back to Gus, and we can start with the questions. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. Oh, I forgot. How's everybody doing? Oh, that was so weak. How's everybody doing? Well, let's wake up. We're in Northeast, right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It is a pleasure and an opportunity to come out. Uh, I thank you very much for allowing us to take time. What uh, Kevin, who's sitting in my seat right now, uh, told me before I got up is to be very short. Uh, when we were at our, our last uh, presentation, we were in a uh, church on, uh, on the west side, and I started to get the Holy Ghost a little bit, and I went on for a little while. So. <laughs> I have, they have to pull me back a little bit, so I'm going to be very short, and then I'm going to sit down. Uh, as the mayor says, uh, and she's very right, well, the reason that we're here is to listen. I think that's the most important part, the biggest part of government, is instead of coming out, uh, speaking to the crowd, or talking to the crowd, it's more important to listen and pay attention to what the customer base wants. I want to introduce uh, uh, my staff very quick, and I had to uh, introduce this handsome devil over there in the corner. That's my uh, partner in crime. That's the fire chief, Niles Ford. The mayor has a bad habit of high and short ball guys. Uh, so it kind of kind of runs, runs the gamut from the police to fire along the same lines. Uh, but I want to introduce uh, Colonel Daryl D'Souza. Yeah. You remember him because he used to be in charge of this area. He did such a good job. I uh, promoted him. I think I promoted you twice already. Is that correct? He's doing a great job. Also, I want to introduce uh, Chief Rodney Hill of Internal Affairs. Lieutenant Colonel Matthews, who also just recently got promoted, used to be in charge of the, Air, um, the Eastern, and Major Worley, who's doing an outstanding job over there in the corner. Let me, let me see if that works one more time. This is Major Worley. And that tells me he's doing an outstanding job, too, so he'll probably be the next one who gets promoted. Uh, <laughs> Why is that boo? <laughs> yeah, and that's good to hear, especially when you connect uh, with your majors. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I want. So I applaud that, and I thank you. And also my chief of staff, uh, Ganesha Martin. Ganesha's in the front row over here. <laughs> and as I uh, close, and, and that's when they're always telling you getting short. As I close, and in my very succinct uh, uh, um, performance here, I was saying, 
Am I very, and I was looking at Shorty when I said that. Shorty, how are you doing? I'm doing good, sir. <laughs> this is the Baltimore Police Department strategic plan. And what this is is our corporate plan. And the reason that is so significant, and then I'm going to sit down, is because it takes the input of the residents and the citizens of the city of Baltimore. And the police department that I am striving to build is the police department that you said in this document that you wanted. So everything that we do is built around what you said that you want. And you hear from the mayor, as she says, the most important piece is to pay attention to the community. We've, we're, we have memorialized it in this document. And this is what we're building. So if you want to be a sergeant in the Baltimore Police Department, we test on this document. If you want to be a lieutenant in the Baltimore Police Department, we test on this document. If you want to be a captain in the Baltimore Police Department, we test on this document. And I'll, every Monday when I have my staff meeting with my staff, this is what we focus on. This is building a customer-driven police department based on what the citizens who pay our taxes, who pay our salaries, say that they want. The document gets down to crime, overall crime, violent crime is most important, overall crime, community, paying attention to the community, listening to the community, being a part of the community, and credibility. Having that credibility that when you say the sky is falling, the sky is actually falling. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Tonight's format, we will have the Q&A uh, where we will present one of the community leaders that are on the front row, those that the mayor actually identified earlier, taking one question from the front and then two to three questions from the floor, coming back to the front, taking a question, and then we will return to the floor. Uh, the purpose of that is many of the residents uh, who are represented on this front row some of which who could not be with us tonight simply sent in questions they, th that they would like asked. Some others brought their questions with them. Uh, certainly no one is being coached. This is an open mic. Uh, we're asking that you respect the format and certainly respect the, fo the, the venue. So when you ask your question, uh, we're asking that you stand, identify yourself, tell us where you're from, what neighborhood you're representing, and then pose your question and then return to your seat. Reason being there are cameras uh, who are recording and taping, one, those of you who are asking the question, and then they're recording uh, either the commissioner or the mayor who will be responding. Uh, everyone has that? Wow, Northeast is quiet. All right, all right. Councilman Kern, or Councilman Scott, did you threaten so I mean, we, no, I'm, I'm only teasing. First up tonight, we have, and we had Mr. Miller who actually gave a welcome earlier, we have Ms. Corinthia Barber who will come up and uh, pose a question. Corinthia Barber, many of you know her as the president of the Ednor Garden Lakeside community. And won't you just give her a round of applause as she comes up here. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Commissioner Batts. Uh, my question, I have a twofold question. First is, uh, Commissioner Batts, you have mentioned that you were, going, you were working on a plan to reconfigure the sectors in the Northeast District. So I'd like to know the status of that and when can we experience some increased patrols as a result of that. The second part of the question has to do with redistricting throughout the city. Um, there are many uh, districts throughout the city that have experienced significant population shifts, but the number of officers assigned to those districts remains the same. And we need some of those in the Northeast District, and we know we'll get them when we, you redistrict the entire city. So Ms. <laughs> Ms. Barber, thank you so, so much for the question. I know that you directed it toward the commissioner. I'm, we're going to do it in tag team. So one of the reasons why I fought so hard and worked in partnership with the commissioner on the new police contract was we know that the whole, this issue, I've been talking about it for years. I know I'm, I get tired of listening to Curran talk about it. Yeah, it's been longer than five. Yeah, so I know we know it's been an issue, right? We also know that um, during that time, we've talked about how difficult it is to redistrict, to redraw the lines just for one district. And we've had, we've, we've gone around and around and around this issue, right? But one of, you said to death, right? We've, done, we've had a conversation. There. But one of the reasons why I fought so hard for the new police contract is because it alleviates that issue altogether. Because we're able to be a more nimble police department and put officers where they are needed, we don't have to 
worry about redistricting the whole city because we can put officers where they're needed when they are needed. So it doesn't matter the the redrawing the lines matters less. So that's you know I'm excited about the new contract. I know the police commissioner is, the deputy mayor is, but it will help us to be a more nimble police department all over the city and be more responsive so we can get you the results that you want and quicker than we would be able to totally redraw the lines, right? And I'll turn it over to the police commissioner. They have to approve it, right? When is the vote? Oh, July 1st. No. Where they work fast. All right, I'll turn. Did you want to add anything, Commissioner? I did. Uh, very, very quickly. Um, one of the things, in, in the, when I came in uh, almost 18, 19 months ago, each of the council people sat down with me and, and they told me their hot button issue. Uh, and probably out of the five, five of the council people, and, and three of them are, are right here that said that number one issue is redistricting. And so I haven't come in just saying that we're going to talk about this. I, I don't like talking about things. I like doing things. And so uh, we had to go through the contract, much like the mayor said, uh, and I applaud her leadership for allowing us to do that, to make a more efficient police organization to come out with that contract. A gentleman who was at the spearhead of that that doesn't get a lot of recognition is Deputy, Deputy Mayor Bob Maloney. He was part of that. Give him a round of applause because he worked on that very diligently for eight months. Uh, and he doesn't get enough thank yous, but I have to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you at the hard work that he did to put that together for us. But the, big, the biggest thing is um, this is one of the first departments I've been in where the contract, at, when I walked in the door, the contract told me where I could deploy my resources and how I could put, deploy my resources. And what that means is that my resources, I couldn't, when I'm the, the chief of police or a commissioner, I have the ability to move those resources based on crime. Uh, but here it was locked into a contract and the hours are locked into the contract. And we had the same amount of hours at, same amount of police officers out on the street at 4 a.m. as we did at 4 p.m. Well, if you know crime, crime doesn't work that way. Crime basically at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon starts to spike in most cities. It goes up to about 9 o'clock, then it kind of plateaus, and it plateaus again at 12 o'clock midnight, and at 2 a.m. it starts dropping off. And it drops off until probably about 7 o'clock in the morning, and then it starts moving up a little slowly. Then again at 2 o'clock it spikes up, and it goes through this cycle and this ebbs and flows. So you don't need as many officers at 4 a.m. in the morning as you do at 4 p.m. at night, which makes no sense. It makes you a very inefficient organization. What it ends up doing is that you spend more overtime at 4 p.m. in the afternoon or 5, 6, 7, 8 when the crime goes up, and then you have too many people who are at 4 a.m. in the morning. So we, we, through this contract, we're able to balance the police organization to make it more efficient, to put more resources at the time that we need them, and not spend the overtime at the level that we were spending before because we have them uh, uh, deployed at that, at that certain time. And then we have, we have, a, then we have a, a consultant that we have brought in who has done major organizations throughout the United States to look at the, the lines and take a look at the lines. And as the mayor said, that gives us the leeway in that contract to do that. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. Now we will go to the floor. We have two members of the mayor's staff. Mr. Larry Nunley, if you could just raise your hand. And Mr. Kevin Slayton, if you could just raise your hand. Actually, there was a hand up uh, near Kevin Slayton in the back. Uh, first question to ask from the floor. Don't everyone be bashful or shy? Yes, sir, in the Under Armour cap. Yes, I see you, sir. I see you. Yes, my name is Mark Willis, and uh, from down at uh, South Baltimore, <coughs> Mount Olivet area, down near West Side Shopping Center. And uh, the issue is, uh, what I see with the police department, it's, it's still a, a gap because the average citizen don't even ask a police officer for direction as they lost. If they traveling past them and they, they lost, they ask a citizen before they ask the police officer. So there's still some kind of distance between the police officer and the citizen. And I, I really agree with the um, curfew law. I think that's important because they is out too late and on the main quarters of the streets of Baltimore wandering around. And then the third issue is that it's still a lot of police brutality stuff is going on. But uh, I still don't understand for traffic violations, you got people sitting in the gutters. Yeah. And then you got people, the police is pulling guys' pants down and all this stuff. If, if this, just get them in the wagon and do it because 
is still when the citizen, other citizens see this, they like, they still doing the same thing. They thug just like the citizens that we trying to lock up. So I think that need to be handled more respectful between how y'all arrest these guys. I seen this for an addict, throw them, grab them in the throat, hitting them in the gut, this for one pill of drugs. And then the, the fourth issue, as I'm patrolling the area for eight hours, I should know who can't speak. I should know who uh, alcoholic. I should know who the drug dealer. You shouldn't just be running up. You should know who the hardworking man and woman in your boundaries. You traveling every day. Amen. You should say, oh, that's that man. He coming home from work. That woman, she getting off from work. Y'all jacking the same people up as working, paying y'all salary. Amen. And the ones that's been out there all day on the corner, y'all giving them a passport to, to hang. And then when y'all get ready to get punch the clock, then you say, hey, I'm ready to get off. Let me lock him up and stay in a, down at the headquarters for two hours, fill in the paper, and go home. So all that got to be tightened up. If you're running a boundary, you should know the people in your boundary. That's coming together. I want to make sure I get to all of your questions. First, Mr. Willis, thank you so much for being here uh, this evening. And your concerns, the ones that you're raising, that's exactly why we're here. When I was looking for a police commissioner, the new police commissioner for Baltimore City, I made it abundantly clear to this commissioner and the other candidates that I knew that we could not have a situation where our resident felt like they were under siege and then think that they were going to want to work with us to improve safety. I knew that we had to do better. So a lot of the things that we're working on, when I talked about the new contract, that by putting more officers out on the street, it means that we have, we're giving the officers more time to build those relationships that we want them to make. If they are stressed and always, and stress, when I mean stress, I mean not like you know, stressed out. I mean, time stressed. So if they're spending the, the vast majority of their time responding to 911 calls, you can't run back and forth responding to calls and then get to know the people that we want, everybody wants you to get to know. You have to have time to do that. So by putting the officers on the street when we need them most, we're giving them an opportunity not to just run from call to call, but to, to do what we say we want them to do to develop those relationships, and that's part of the, the strength of this new uh, contract. And with respect to brutality, it's a, it is a, a very big concern of mine. I'm very proud that we have seen those numbers go down. Uh, in br brutality, the number of discourtesy complaints have gone down. Every time I speak to a graduating class, I am uh, very clear that they need to treat every person in the city the same way that they would want someone to treat their family. Um, that's how I was raised, and I think it's very important that people are very clear what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And we've also, and I'll let the commissioner talk about the training that he's, he's doing, um, and I can also say that we have seen the, when you, when you know that the relationship is getting better, you see the fruit of that relationship, and we have seen a significant increase, I think over 300% increase in the amount of information that we're getting from are um, from community members. So to me, that is showing, when you look at all of those numbers together, that we are moving in the right direction. Perfect, no, but progress, yes. I'd like to echo uh, what the mayor is saying. You know, a number of the things that uh, Mr. Willis stood up and talked about are in this document. And that's not something that I'm trying to hide from, and it's not something that I'm running from, it's not something that I'm going to ignore. The reality is, is that uh, these things didn't, didn't just happen over 18 months, in the 18 months that I've been here. My job is to build and construct a way to cure them, to solve them, and that's why the mayor asked me to come in the first place. I want to tell you how we're trying to better uh, the relationship, Mr. Willis, within uh, our city, within the police department, because some of the things that you're saying are, are spot on, and we have to admit that. And you, you start getting better when you admit that there's an issue there to start correcting things. And so I come here, I call balls and strikes, I don't try to play games with people. I'm being straightforward, and I'll tell you when we, we do things well. I'll tell you when we don't do things as well and that we need to get better at those things. But we're, we're trying to change the culture in our relationship in the community in a lot of different ways. Just right now, I have officers who are going out to areas where we have violence that has taken place, and I'm taking these officers out of patrol, 
and I'm replacing them with NSU for a couple hours. I'm having them set up, and we're, we're, uh, the Parks and Rec uh, Department allow us to take their, what they call a fun truck or a fun wagon, something along that line. What it really is is just a lot of uh, basketballs, different uh, equipment that are uh, in, the, in the trucks, and we're going out to, those, the, to that location where we have some violence or issues that take place, and those officers are going to start interacting by a couple hours playing basketball with those kids or playing kickball out there with those kids. Now, people may say, well, that's not a big deal, and that's why we pay officers. It's about the relationship. It's critical to get our relationship on a level that is different, that kids are not used to seeing us drag their uncles or fathers or brothers off to jail, but we're seen as a part of this community, not an occupying army. We're also starting to, to have what I call Explorer Academy because, uh, where's that fire chief? There, that handsome devil back there again, the fire chief. The mayor, at every meeting, the mayor talks about how the fire chief is doing a wonderful job in making a feeder pool for, for young people who want to become firefighters. So one of the things that I said I wanted to do is take what Mr. Willis said is how do we change our relationship? Number two, how do we get more, more Baltimoreans into being police officers in the city of Baltimore where they grew up? And we have uh, what is called police explorers. They're like Boy Scouts but they work in the police department. And so this, this summer, and we're just starting this because I'm looking for funding at this point in time now. I have most of the questions answered, food for the kids, a uh, location for them to play. And so not that we just go in and we occupy a, occupy a community, but we're going in and we're bringing young people out who want to be police explorer scouts. And we're putting on an explorer academy. Really what I'm doing is offering kids the opportunity to become part of the police, the police department, but also getting them out of, off of the streets in the middle of the daytime to have activities and to play. And if my dream comes true, because it's a vision right now and just a dream, is that I will touch 500 kids this summer and get them off of the streets during the middle of the summertime and the daytime. So we're going to have them at our police academy from 9 to noon. Uh, we're going to put out marketing right now to people who want their kids to, to participate in this. Uh, but we're going to teach the kids lacrosse, flag football, basketball, uh, but those are just the hooks that we're going to get them in. We're also going to look to teach them some MMA. You know what that is, mixed martial arts? Well, the next last time I said that, the mayor almost came in glue. Because they're not going to be they're not going to be fighting or wrestling and all that. But to do mixed mar martial arts, you have to have the discipline to train. And so it's going to be more focused on training and CrossFit and things along those lines to get them in shape and to kind of burn the, burn the energy off. My, my kids are grown adults now. They're like 31, 27, and 24. When they were kids, I, I had them running around doing as much as they possibly can because at nighttime they sit down and go sleep, right? So I'm going to have these kids out here running around doing as much as they possibly can, getting them active out there at our police academy where they see our police recruits when the police recruits are coming out there and hopefully get them hooked that after we do the summer program that they are continue to want to be a police explorer scout. They go from a police explorer scout to what we call a police cadet and then become a police officer. What I'm saying is whether the officers are out there in the basketball where they're out here with the camp, and it's not a PAL program, it's to teach the kids to become Explorer Scouts because we want them to become police officers. We're trying to change our relationship within this community. The reason that the mayor has us out here, the reason that the mayor is doing this, is changing our relationship within the community. I'm out on a regular basis. I go to places that most commissioners haven't gone before to change the relationship that we have on a regular basis. We're going to, and everywhere that we go, I know you're probably saying I need to sit down. Everywhere that we probably go, is I hear from every community, walking beats, walking beats, walking beats, officer friendly. And so what we're trying to do is do creative ways where we're not walking into the community and impacting the community in a negative way, that we're trying to be a positive source to help and to bring hope. Because to tell you in the reality, when I started to get the Holy Ghost at that other theater, because <laughs> I'm at the other church, I'm about to get to it, is that I am tired of seeing the young men losing their lives in this city. I am tired of seeing the death and destruction. I've been to three different cities, and it's the same in these urban environments. And, and together, we can make a difference. And it's not going to be just the government doing it. It has to be the community doing it. And so when you have some young man out there who has a gun in his hand and takes a human life, how did that young man get there? He didn't start that day. He wasn't born that way. He just didn't occur that way. There was a path that that young man took. And what if we could save that young man? before he became that 20-year-old with that gun in his hand. And that's what we're trying to do in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, my, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mark, and uh, I live in the neighborhood. I grew up in the neighborhood, live in the neighborhood. And, um, you know, what you said about um, when these young people take a life and that type of thing, how did they get there? That's, that's my main thing is, is these kids not 
killing each other. It's been a lot said about no transparency and the reconnection centers and all that. Um, could you, you know, guys expound on that? Because it's been a lot of criticism. I mean, you know, I'm all for us having resources for the families so we can help these people that's in hard, hard places due to addiction, poverty, you know, and uh, family upheaval and that type of thing. So, and in the community, the police being out in the community, talking to people, you know, not just talking to each other, but talking to people and stuff like that. I know that will help, but could you guys expound? Because there's a lot of people confused. You know, you got the ACLU and other folk, you know, saying it's not going to work and you guys haven't even did it, did it yet. So could you expound on what's going to happen in the reconnection centers, what the resources are going to be? Are they going to be helping families emotionally, mentally, you know, help, helping these kids, you know, in the homeless and all that kind of stuff? And do you guys know it's $100 million available for mental health through the federal government that probably could, you guys could, you know, get together and sit down and talk and find out how we could get some of that money to come in and help? Yes, Mr. Mark, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to ask two people to respond to that, and I'll fill in any blanks. First, I want to thank the bill sponsor, the, the uh, curfew extension bill sponsor, Councilman uh, Brandon Scott, for having the courage to, to step up and to address something that we all know as a community has been going on for far too long. It doesn't matter what part of town I go in. Um, you know, people all different walks of life are telling, are saying thank you, and I say tell the councilman thank you because this is his bill. We work together uh, in establishing common sense uh, reforms to our uh, curfew law because they were outdated and we weren't. Um, it's not just the, the past four years, but they haven't been enforced for uh, decades, and we needed to do something different, and we needed to hold parents accountable. And the council worked very hard. Uh, through the budget, through the committee process to address the, the concerns that were raised, you know, with the issue of criminalization, all of those things. So I want to hear from the bill sponsor, and I know that my director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Angela Johnnies, is here. I'm going to ask her to come up while the councilman is speaking, and then I'll fill in any gaps. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for the support. For this issue, I think it's easiest to do is just by a show of hands, Everyone that thinks kids should be out at 10 o'clock on a school night, raise their hand. Thank you. One person. So the overwhelming majority of the city of Baltimore thinks this is old school common sense, as the mayor said, that if we're, our, our young children have to be up at 6, 6.30. When I was in high school, going to Merville, the greatest high school in Baltimore City, <laughs> I had to be up and on the bus stop at 5.45. If I'm out at 11 p.m., at night, then the hours aren't there for me to go to sleep, to get the proper sleep. So this is what this is about. Old school common sense. When I was growing up in the 90s, yes, actually I was 10 years old the year the curfew was put in place, and doesn't, didn't matter. If the street light came on, and if I wasn't in that house, then I couldn't walk for two days. But this is, this is what this is about. If you're someone like me who, who's seen, this is about common sense. This isn't about criminalizing the kids. In fact, uh, contrary to what you heard on TV, we actually removed all criminal penalties from the bill. And we added in that parents cannot pay the fine if they go to a family strength and training course or if they go to a community service course. Because this is what this is really about, connecting the young kids and their families that are really vulnerable to services. If you've seen it, and I know we all have seen it, a four, or five, six-year-old just walking by themselves or in a liquor store that they're not supposed to be in, at 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, you know what's going on. These aren't the children that are out here committing the crimes. This, again, I have to say it again, this is not about reducing crime. This is not about violence reduction for youth. This is about protecting and connecting these young people. And that's why I introduced the bill, and thank you for your support. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the question. I'm Angela Johnnies. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office on Criminal Justice. And thank you, Madam Mayor and Councilman Scott for the curfew legislation. My office is working with a number of agencies from the city of Baltimore and also community partners to implement the Youth Connection Center. And what we're trying to do, we're working with the Health Department, Department of Recreation and Parks, Employment Development, the whole array of youth and child serving agencies because we recognize that one agency cannot do this alone. 
we are planning to staff the Youth Connection Center with staff who, first of all, care about children and are able to work with families because we recognize that's not everyone's strength. So we want to make sure that that's a core value of the Youth Connection Center. Once a young person is brought into the Connection Center, and we want and thank you for the need to educate people, young people will not be handcuffed and transported in police cars when we've operated what we know as the summer curfew center, youth are transported in the old PAL vans. So it's not like the young people are arrested and booked. They are brought to a location where they can be assessed by staff to determine what their needs are, what has them out in the middle of the night, what services can we provide to the young person and the family to keep them safe to strengthen them and turn them into positive young people and positive young adults. Right now, we're hoping to hire community connectors who can assess the young people and refer them to services that include mentoring, educational supports, substance abuse, or mental health counseling if needed. And we are working to eventually be able to provide those services on site so that this connection center can be a one-stop shop and that families and young people can con get connected in one place. And one more thing, in terms of curfew violations versus being able to come to the Connection Center voluntarily, this is about improving circumstances for our young people and our families. And so we hope that we can work to the Connection Center being a place that young people and families can come to voluntarily, that they don't have to wait until they have interaction with law enforcement but that they'll see this as a welcome opportunity to get the services that they need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. I think you can tell from listening to her why I, I chose her as a mayor's office of uh, criminal justice director. She has, is in her spirit you know, to, to care about kids and to make sure that we're not criminalizing kids, we're protecting kids. And this is, this is all this is about. And again, I wanna thank uh, the councilman uh, for the, the legislate, yeah, yeah, I want to thank everybody, the council, everybody for supporting it. We all work together. And, you know, this is a thing that I think people forget because they're trying to make it something it's not. And they're trying to twist my words to make it something that they're not. This is about protecting young people. And this is about being clear that if, you're ch if you think it's okay for your kids to run around on the street, just be out there with them. Supervise them. Right? If you think that's okay. But if, 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 if nobody in here thinks it's okay, except for Mr. Shorty, for the kids to be running around unsupervised after 10 o'clock, then we, have to, we can't ignore the fact that it's happening. And we have to do... So he asked you if, people, if young people should be running around. Okay. All right. Okay. So the question was asked, is there anyone who thinks that children should be running around after 10 o'clock? Okay, so, the, and, so as I said, the, the overwhelming majority of the people who are here, as well as the people I've come in contact with, believe that kids should, could, kids should be supervised and not be running around unsupervised. So that being said, again, I wanna thank the council members for the the councilman and this, the councilman for, the, for their support. And just make sure if it comes up that you're, that you're clear with people that this is about connecting vulnerable kids and families to the support that they need. We, there's no reason why I should have been in a connection center and seen a seven-year-old or eight-year-old out on the street unsupervised by an adult at two o'clock in the morning. I could barely keep my eyes open. Why are they walking around on the street? With nobody, with nobody. And for us to turn a blind eye to it, I think, I think is wrong. If we know it's a problem, we look for a solution. That's what we have. And we're gonna to try to work with everybody who wants to make sure that we're protecting our kids to get this right. Thank you. Councilman Scott, Madam Mayor, thank you. We have a question from the floor. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Shirley Street. I am a former early childhood educator I'm 42 years old and I've had three strokes. I have a 16 year old daughter. And I'm homeless. I did early childhood education from 1995 to 2006. 
and that can no longer work. I stay wherever I can stay. And I want to know if someone can, how can you, is there anything that can be done to help me and my child find out a room or one bedroom or something? I do have an income. I receive disability. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, I don't know how you want to do it if you want to step out and we can have one of our um, team members from the uh, mayor's office and neighborhood uh, talk to you and we can connect you with some resources. I thank you for coming out and I know that it was difficult for you to speak out, so I want to thank you. So however you want to do it, if you want to uh, go outside, and they can do it, it would probably be best not to do it in here. Um, but we'll make sure before the evening is over that we connect you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, there are a number of people, Ms. Street, that will assist you. I know that the community liaison, Ms. Andrea Curley, is in the room somewhere. She's in the back. But I'm, I'm going to ask also another member of the mayor's office of neighborhoods. You just raise your hand. There are some staff. Oh, they're, okay, they're outside, out front. Um, as you take your time to make your way to, to the next. I saw another hand up on this side. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me, before you speak, ma'am, uh, and Ms. Street makes her way out, <clears throat> I just would like to say for the sake of time, uh, I'm thankful that those of you who are being concise with your questions, uh, if you would just pose your question uh, as concisely as possible so that the mayor and the commissioner can respond. Uh, Mr. Davis, you have attended at least six of the seven police forum districts, uh, and you have posed a question probably at the at least four or five of them. Uh, so we're going to make sure that our neighbors in the room who have not had an opportunity to ask a question, that they're given an opportunity to ask a question. Is that fair, family? Can I hear a round of applause from the neighbors? Thank you. Yes, ma'am, you want to introduce yourself and give us your question? Yes, my name is LaVon White, and I'm a member of the Ramblewood Community Association, uh, where our president is um, Joe Armstead and we meet at Leithwalk Elementary School on a every other month basis. My question, I agree with um, the brother Willis talking about police brutality, uh, and I, I hear your comments about what you're gonna do to try to fix that. I was also wanting to see whether or not cameras could be added into police vehicles to kind of record some things that are going on in our communities, because my understanding is we have so many uh, suspicious death in the police custody cases that are going forward. And I'm, I'm kind of afraid sometimes myself. I have a nephew that lives with me. He's young. He's been stopped several times. So I just was wondering if that could be a ish, uh, something to consider. The other thing is about police response in my community. Um, I'm hearing complaints from some of my neighbors, since I'm kind of like the only one who goes to the community meetings, that the response time has been quite delayed. Some telling me 20 minutes, some telling me 30 minutes. I was just wondering, you know, how come those um, delays are there? And I am in agreement with the curfew process because I've had my car vandalized so many times, it's not funny. And it's because of kids being out. So I'm in agreement with that. I'm glad for the changes that took away the criminal process of it. I'm in full agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Very good questions. I think the first one, I try to keep track of them, write them all down. What was your, your last name, ma'am? White. W what? White. 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 Hey, that's my mother's maiden name. All right, Miss White, we may be related. Where are your people from? <laughs> Is it what part of the South? That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Jacksonville? Raleigh? Talk, talk. We're going to have to talk later. We may be related there. You know, we may have a conversation along, along those lines. Uh, very quickly, uh, we, we, uh, Ms. White uh, talked about cameras. Um, I was at a, 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 a convention not too long ago of uh, chiefs of police here just recently, and they were talking about cameras. And where I, where I used to be employed years ago is uh, we were one of the first agencies uh, to put cameras on police officers in the United States as a whole. And we had little lapel cameras that we put on. And uh, I started that program. But as I did that program, because it was cutting edge, there's a, what, I, what I learned, there was a number of things that need to be cured. So my bottom line is I'm open to cameras. I got to run that up my flagpole to my bosses to make sure that, that they're okay with that. But the issue is uh, what we found out the hard way, one of privacy. Because when we had those cameras on, and I made the officers, anytime they came in contact with a, a resident, turn that camera on. But we go into homes, 
where you have very sensitive issues that are taking place, and we're filming those issues. And so you may have a rape situation, you may have uh, other violence that take place in the household, it may be allegations that are not true that take place, and we're recording all those things, so it's not any, any uh, contact that we have. And what I learned is that the press has a right to that information. So if we record it, and we're in your house, and we're recording that interaction, and that interaction is not always true. I mean, it may be that you have a kid who is disorderly, and the kid is uh, uh, blaming you for things and making things up. We catch that. We, the, the press has a right to get that. So one of the things that I found is privacy is an issue that we have to take care of and that we have to address. Uh, and so what I've done is, is, is talked about pushing that down the road for a little bit uh, to we, we can evaluate and work it out. And, and uh, a, a group called Major City Chiefs, we're work, they're working out policies right now because of those issues that are popping up. And they're coming out with a policy that will cover some of these things. So I'm waiting for that to occur, and then we'll take a look. There's also extra cost that comes with that. Uh, in a small agency that I, I used to be in, which was about uh, 800 police officers to outfit all the patrol officers there, I think, and don't quote me at this, it was pretty close to uh, a million, a million point three to put those cameras on those police officers who were out there and then have storage units. Because when you, once you record that, you have to store that data. And if you get rid of that data, people are going to say, it's a conspiracy. You got rid of that data because you're not storing it. You don't want us to see it. So you got to hold on to that data, too. So there's a lot of cost that goes along with that but we're open. I don't like in-car videos. I like, I like the cameras on the officers because I want to I see any interaction that the officers has. What we did see, conversely that people are, are not aware, is that the citizen complaints dropped off the table because uh, um, you have the cameras, you have that interaction. You can go, if you want an internal affairs investigation, you just go to the camera and pull it out. And you can see the interaction between the citizen and the, and the police officer too at the same time. And you can see that some of those allegations or some of those complaints against officers weren't always true and that they were thrown out there, but you have the evidence now, and that's how I sold it to those officers. I said, you have the evidence now of that interaction, and whether it makes officers act better or if it makes citizens act better, I don't care. Is that it's the facts and that it's recorded, and if you have any violent contact that takes place, officer-involved shooting, or any time that you use force, it's recorded, and we can take a look. What I can tell you this is that there is no time that I've ever seen a use of force that looks pretty, none, ever. When you have the legal right is done properly, there is no time that you're hitting the human body that it looks good. It is no time when you're wrestling around with the human body that it looks good. There is no time that that ever looks proper. It just doesn't. So we're looking for different ways on the front end so we don't get to that place. So we're doing a lot of training within the police department right now. We're doing training on how we do better tactics so we're more sound so we don't have to uh, go to higher levels of, of force. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now, and I haven't found the cure for this, and there, there again, Mr. Willis, I'm just being honest, calling ball and strikes, is that uh, there's, there's, you talked about having a, a young men or men sit on the curb with the legs crossed, right? We see that. Anybody see that? We're driving down the street and our guys. Well, I can tell you, that doesn't feel good to me. It doesn't feel good to me, but I understand why we're doing it, and I like to explain to you why, why we're doing that. Am I doing okay on time? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and why we're doing that. And different police departments have it in different places. Other agencies that I've been at, you have guys have their hands spread and their hands on the hood. And uh, on a hot hood on a 90 degree day and that engine is running and it burns the hands also. The reason is, is when we stop people, there's times that people stab us, shoot us, hit us, and do different things. And what you try to do is keep them off balance. If you have them sitting on the ground with their legs crossed and their hands behind their heads, it becomes very difficult for them to jump up, hit me in the face, shoot me, or stab me. What I am taught, what I was taught 33 years ago when I went through a police academy, is this is what kills you. This is what I was talking to, taught in the police academy. This is what kills you. So until you have control of this, you don't have control of the situation. So whether you are the police, the police officer stopping someone and you have their hands behind their head, or if you have them sitting on the ground with their legs crossed, the purpose of that is to make it more difficult for them to get up, stab you, shoot you, and to slow them down so you have time to react. Now, for that, I also know that I came from uh, South Central L.A., and I also know that I grew up in a very poor neighborhood. It's very important for me to tell people that and understand that I understand what it's like. I've been on the other side. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. The reality of that is that it's also seen as being humiliating, too, at the same time. If I'm a grown man and I'm coming somewhere and I'm in front of my son, I have to sit on the, sit on the ground with my legs crossed or on a hot hood with my legs spread or with my hands behind my head, I understand that. What I have to do is find a balance between the two. I have to keep these officers safe by giving them the skills and tactics that keep them safe, but also I have to, to, to balance 
making sure that the community is not uh, put in a position where they feel humili humiliated too at the same time. So that's part of bringing people in and we're training, training on new tactics and new ways of doing things. Now that's not going to change overnight because I have an entire police department to train to, to get there. But we're looking at new and better ways of doing that. We have other training that call, that's called legitimacy training. And what that is, is having the organization understand what it's like to grow up in the communities of Baltimore. What we're trying to get across to them, because some, some of our officers don't come from the city of Baltimore. They didn't, they didn't go to Mervo. They didn't, they didn't go to Dunbar. They didn't go to Polly. Uh, they didn't go, I'm, I'm stopped because I can't say a lot of them. I'll, be, I'll lose them. Usually I have to apologize for that because I always miss one somewhere. Uh, but the reality is, is that some may not have grown up in the neighborhoods that we're used to. Now, I can go into neighborhoods, and, and if you guys have heard me speak, I always talk about where I grew up, where you had plastic on the couch. Anybody have plastic on the couch? Yes, sir. You know what I'm talking about? And you couldn't sit on that? You couldn't sit on the furniture, too? Anybody eat fried bologna sandwiches at dinner? Yeah, yeah. Anybody have that Black Panther and velvet up on the wall? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? See, I can, I can relate because that's where I come from. You understand? We come from North Carolina, right, Miss White? So you can understand. But not all of my officers come from uh, some of our communities. And, not some of, and so what we're trying to do is give them the tools, the skills, to how to interact in our communities and what the expectations are. Because the values and the norms are a little different in certain communities, and you have to understand that. So we're training officers so they can be more empathetic to what's going on in communities and to understand. And understand that when a young lady says, I'm homeless, that she doesn't want to be homeless, that she wants help, and that what our role is, I'm starting to sound like a preacher, aren't I? What our, and I'm sorry, because I believe it in my heart. What our role is to provide hope. What our role is is to bring hope and try to solve problems instead of bringing or exacerbating problems further. So we're train, changing, we're growing, we're bringing in a lot of training. I'm not going to cover a lot of it, but I'm just giving you an example of it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And I have to talk about response times real quick, if I may. Big pardon? What, you, what, what was that, Commissioner? Okay. And by the way, uh, yes, sir, we have uh, yes, I'm, Major. I'm Major Rich Whirl. He wanted to talk about the response time. Basically, we've done several things that have increased our response time. It actually started in the Northeast with Colonel D'Souza. He started the telephone reporting unit. Now it's been adopted citywide where the officers are at headquarters and they take the calls that officers on the street don't have to handle. They handle the calls, they write the report, and that takes away a call that the officer has to respond to. We also have online reporting where you can report incidents online that also frees up officers. But there's always going to be a few times when the officers are going to be delayed getting there. But anything that becomes a priority one call, which is a call in progress, it leapfrogs every call that's just for a report or something else, and the officer is dispatched to that right away. And then in your area, we've also, our summer plan has come out where we've got several officers from downtown that have been brought from inside, put out on foot posts. And I know you guys saw it because I got the email saying you saw them on Ramblewood. Now, they, they won't be there every day because we've got a large area to cover, but we move them around so they don't know where we're coming or what days we're there. So it keeps them on their toes and that will only help every community in the district. Thank you, sir. I do want to thank uh, City Councilman Warren Branch uh, for being here as well. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am, with Kevin Slayton. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. And I just wanted to comment, compliment Councilman Brandon Scott for the curfew because it is sorely needed. Um, I'm a product of the old school. My name is Joyce Gant, and I'm an active member of the Lock Raven Improvement Association. I'd like to also compliment Major Morley for the work that he's done on Ramblewood Road and the Northeast Corridor. My question is, well, my comment is, I wonder how many people here grew up in the recreation centers, or were, was, you, you all remember the recreation centers? <laughs> so my, my, my question is, we have so many youth today who have nothing to do but play on the streets of Baltimore City. They're on Ramblewood Road, aren't they, Major Worley? They're downtown. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand what happened to the recreation centers. I mean, I'd like to see a state-of-the-art rec built in every quarter of the city, northeast, southeast, because we've got so much crime down in Cherry Hill, it's ridiculous. And I don't, we don't know if it's a gang war going on, but the kids in the streets know what's going on. So my, my question is, 
when will we ever be able to see state-of-the-art recs being built in four parts of the city that sorely need it? Because the gangs are recruiting our children, and they have recruited our children. Thank you very much, Ms. Gant. So the, you talked about when are we going to see it. We're starting already. Uh, the, the, when, when I became mayor, the previous administration had closed all the PAL centers. Uh, and it closed all the PAL centers without a plan for what was next. And, right? and I, had, uh, I became mayor. You don't understand the circumstances. First budget I had had a $121 million budget deficit. Right? And at that time, we all knew we needed more. We needed more uh, programming uh, and more recreation center opportunities, but we also knew the condition. And I had, I had um, people from all over the city take a look at all of the recreation centers. Same thing we're doing here with public safety, but around recreation. I asked them to look. Well, I wanted to grade the facilities, and what did we see? We saw some facilities that were so run down. I know I wouldn't send my child to them. Right? I wouldn't send my enemy to it. If you have to, you have to go to a rec center with the no doors on the stalls, that's why the numbers were so low. We would have some recreation centers where there would be 200 kids in a day would go there. Why? Because we had uh, programs that kids liked, the facilities were, fun, the, the facilities were good, and you know, people were used to using them. And then we had some that in a, in a month there wouldn't be 200 kids. We're spending the same amount on both of those. And that didn't make sense to me because you can't, Spend the same dollar twice, right? We can't have what we want, which is state of the arts, and continue to pay for these dilapidated ones at the same time. So I knew how I was raised, and that was to be honest and to be forth and to be forthright, even when it was difficult. I knew the type of elected official and public servant I wanted to be, and I didn't want to be the kind that would leave it open just so I say I did, when I know it wasn't what anybody wanted. So I had to be willing to have tough conversations with people. And, I, and we did. I said, we cannot have the state-of-the-art centers that you want, larger, commercial kitchens, longer hours, better staff. We can't have that and keep all of these dilapidated, rundown, and underused ones open. We can, just can't do it, right? So that means you have to close some and plan for growth. And that's what we've been doing. You talk about Cherry Hill. We have a new center coming online in Cherry Hill. We have the new Rita Church that's been renovated as a state of art community center. We've seen the numbers go up. And we're doing that all over the city. And so the plan that the the, the plan that I have is to make to put those centers all over the city. And we're not going to do it overnight, but we have a plan that is transforming recreation to make it what people would want to go to and not just something that's a last resort. That's what I would want to send my daughter to, and that's what I'm going to provide for the community. State of the art, recreation centers, longer hours, more staff, better programming throughout the city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We had, yes, sir, Mr. Mark Washington. We're coming back to the front row. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Gus. has a Thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, Commissioner Batts. Uh, my name is Mark Washington. That is not a staged photo. That is actually a uh, public safety walk that we took in Chum. Those are Chum residents. I was at the uh, public safety forum on the east side and I heard somebody say that was a staged photo. And I was like, nah, that's not a staged photo. That's real people doing real public safety work. Uh, I, I see that Mark uh, somehow photoshopped me out, but that's okay. <laughs> um, the uh, Rita Church Rec Center that the uh, uh, Madam Mayor uh, mentioned is in my community, and of course, phase two uh, will be started soon. And, and I really do appreciate that. Um, I do appreciate the question that Mr. Willis asked earlier because it was the question that I had in mind. Um, a good friend of mine, Tony, uh, died at the hands of the police department. And what was more egregious after his death was the inaction of the state's attorney's office. Oh and I don't want to politicize that, but I'm from the east side. I know what it's like. Um, Councilman Scott is a good friend of mine, and we kind of went back and forth on the curfew issue. But what we have to understand is that it's the responsibility of government to protect and to look out for those who are most vulnerable. And it's a shame that that has to be done through a curfew law, but that's the reality in which we live in. But 
I, I, I digress. My, took me a while to think of another question because there were so many uh, great questions. My question has to do not so much with the police department, it's more or less a uh, community question and has to do with um, collaborative support coming from other city agencies. I will give you uh, two examples here. Uh, Major Worley has become my secretary. Every time that there is this police action taken at a home in Chum, Major Worley now sends a letter out to the landlord or to the property owner notifying them in a very nice way that some type of uh, need for police service occurred at their home. Now what happens is we automatically get calls from residents that say, hey, wait a minute, you know, nothing's going on here. And all we do is simply try to figure out how we can help. The most interesting calls come from the landlords who know sometimes that their properties are involved in illegal or criminal activity, but yet they still profit from that. There is no law that applies to them for aiding, abetting, or harboring criminal activity, and I think that's uh, unjust. Yeah. Nevertheless, the question is, and I'm sorry. Question. Thank you, Gus. Uh, <laughs> Man, <speak to laughs> what, <laughs> you know what? Um, the question is, what strategy do you all have for um, aiding and assisting the police department by having other city agencies come to their support? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for walking with us. Um, I, I thought I saw your, your ear back here in the, the just joking. Um, so you know I believe in interagency approach. We've taken that approach in, in tackling areas where we've had chronic violence repeatedly. We started in the Oliver community on the east side. We've done, a, a, we've done one on the, the west side, and um, I know Kevin Cleary's in the back. Which was the one we just finished? Right, Madison Monument, and that's where we take all of the city agencies and our um, out-of-city uh, partners, such as BGE and some other uh, the places, and then we, we take that interagency approach. Um, I know that we have our schedule for where we're doing that for this year, uh, but I know, uh, you know, we can work together on if that approach will work in the, the Chum community, because I do not believe it's on the schedule for that interagency uh, task force this year, but we can work on it. In the meantime, you know, just we'll, we can talk about specific issues about where there needs to be additional support and we can get that support for you. You know, we've, we've made a lot of progress and we're not done. Part of, if I could also add to that, uh, Madam Mayor, is that I was having a discussion with uh, this gentleman who we just tracked down right now, Daryl D'Souza. Uh, he doesn't know what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna give him the microphone. Uh, I had a, a meeting with my executive team in my office this afternoon, and part of the discussion was uh, we, were, we were putting together a response to some issues that are taking place in the community, a task force. And part of that is what we were doing is that the mayor has set the tone that she, likes, she would like us to respond in a collaborative way with other resources within, and that's community policing as a whole and then sustaining the community. So what Daryl was putting together, I, I will share with him exactly the plan that you were putting together that uses uh, the collaborative method in the police department as we work together. Glad to be back in the Northeast District. Nice. When I got here in 2008, when I got here in 2008, I had no gray hair and I didn't wear glasses. Um, the commissioner has tasked us uh, with respect to the recent violence we've seen to work collaboratively with um, all the city agencies. So we actually are going back at 12 o'clock. All the commanders, all nine commanders from all the districts are going back at midnight tonight to finish the plan off. Um, you guys can bring coffee for us. But we're going to need it. But um, this plan addresses um, issues on the law enforcement side, um, like Ms. Angela Joni said earlier, with juveniles. Um, the city side, lighting, transportation, DPW. It's not just a fight that we plan to do with just the police alone itself. On the police side, however, we've picked and we've located, we've identified certain parts of the city that's seen the greatest spikes. And what I can say is, I, I don't want to share the locations right now, but uh, we have an a, a, um, initiative that's coming forward. Within the next couple of days, it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's really going to hit home for a lot of people. And like the mayor said earlier, it's not, everyone in Baltimore is not bad. We're specifically targeting certain folks, certain areas, certain gangs in the city. And it's not just Baltimore, it's just an entire team effort. So not just here in the Northeast, but other parts of the city, no matter where you live, we need your help. We're going to be deployed out there. If you see something, we're just asking you to be our extra eyes and ears for us.
Thank you, sir. We'll go back to that side of the room, and then we'll come back over here. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, um, Mayor. Uh, my name is Monica Oliver. I I'm a member of the um, Lock Raven Association, and I've heard before that you said that we're going to have this contract signed in July or, or whatever, and that I just heard again that you're going to reallocate the members of the police department wherever there is a problem. But we have been bringing up certain things every month at the um, meeting about certain areas in our area specifically about where there's problems, but we don't see any type of police presentation at all. I live on a block and I don't see one like maybe every 10 days, I would see a police car come down my block. We have called about certain areas and not just young ones, we're talking about the older adults, the teen the ones like from Morgan, where they party outside at two o'clock in the morning. And we have called, but we don't see a police car come back there at all. So Ms. Uh, Oliver, you said you're active in the Lock Raven yes. Association, and have, I just wanna be clear, so we're on the same page. Has there been police representation at your community yes. meetings? Yes, so you're saying has. they've been there, but haven't been responsive? Yes. So let, I, I'd, I'd like to hear first from the major. Uh, and, and then I, I'm going to start, I'm going to have the major respond, but I'm going to say to the Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel, if you would stand real quick, this is Lieutenant Colonel Matthews. Um, in the next meeting that I come to, I don't want to hear that she says that, so I want you to contact her before we leave and make sure that she gets the response and sees the police uh, presence over there other than every 10 days. Would you share with what you've been working on? Yes, sir. Um, basically what we've been doing, it's the same thing, you live Lock Raven, Ramblewood area, um, we've been moving our foot people around. Our officers have been deployed there. Um, can you share which street you're on with me? Wadsworth. Wadsworth, okay. 1500 block? No, 1590. Okay. Back behind Park Raven Apartments. Yes, we, we've actually come up with an agreement, and it's worked really well with us with Park Raven Apartments. They've actually given us the authority to enforce curfew and trespassing incidents on their property. So we make an arrest. For, they don't have to be doing anything on the property. If they're trespassing on the property or not residents, we can make an arrest. So that's helped us a lot. So most likely what we've had is some displacement because we put a lot of emphasis on the Ramblewood and the Park Raven. They've now moved back to your area. So we'll just adjust our tactics and move back to you, and you'll see an improvement. You know, the, the other thing that I wanted to, to comment uh, on another part of the city. So the lieutenant colonel has his mission, ma'am. He will follow up and he will contact you at the end of the meeting. And you see that we have been working there. I did hear what you said about the lighting, so that didn't pass me. So, uh, lieutenant colonel, if we can uh, see if we can address that and deal with that. You know, just uh, yesterday uh, at about noon, I was at Frederick Douglass High School. So I'm going to uh, the different high schools on a regular. Uh, we got a graduate. <laughs> the, old, the oldest black high school in the city, correct? Okay, see, I saw, that's why I didn't mention those high schools, because I knew I was going to miss one. But I was at Frederick Douglass High School yesterday, and I was sitting with uh, probably a group of anywhere from, I think, 15 to 25 young people. And I, and I went there to do what we're doing here, is to listen to the young people and, and to talk to them. And this is the interesting part, uh, because when I was talking to them, they go, Commissioner, why can't we ride our motorcycles wherever we want to ride our motorcycles, our dirt bikes, right? And I said, do any of you guys have a license? Well, no. <clears throat> but we want to ride our dirt bikes. <clears throat> so I, I asked them the question. I said, uh, what is it that we can do as we work with you to try to address this problem in, in a positive way? Well, just give us a place to, to, to motocross where we can go out and do our own motocrossing thing and to address those things. And I said, well, how are you going to get that motorcycle from point A to point B? You know, uh, you don't have a truck. You don't have a license. So how are you going to get that? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Well, do you have insurance that you have to ride, that you can ride that motorcycle or that dirt bike? I shouldn't say the motorcycle, but that dirt bike uh, on the streets. Well, no. Well, why can't we do it? Do you guys ever hear that the adults, you scare the heck out of the adults that are in the west side of this city? That, well, no, that, that shouldn't scare them. I said, okay, let, let me take it to another thing. If we were able, if I had the money and I had the power and I could give you insurance, helmets, equipment, and put you in a space and do this the, the, the right way, would you go there? And they go, yeah, we'll go there and we'll ride. And then one guy said, no, we wouldn't go there. And I said, well, why wouldn't you go there? She says, the fun is you guys chasing us. <laughs> but this is, what, this is what I want to say, then I'm going to bring it back in, is, is, is this, is that there was a young man who went on TV who said uh, that I should be able to ride my motorcycle anyway, and, and he said that the police officer did something, and police officers say that he actually crashed his own motorcycle, but he wants to accuse the police officer. And then his mother came on, 
And his mother said, leave him alone. Let him do whatever he wants to do. If they want to ride bikes in the city of uh, Baltimore, they can ride bikes anytime they want. Do whatever they want to do. Remember when I had that conversation about that 20-year-old who had that weapon and that they weren't born that way? Part of the responsibility, part of the things that we need to start talking about, and I think uh, uh, the young lady, one of the young ladies here was, uh, got up and, and, and talked and said, how did these kids get here? This is, and how can we help? And we talked about Parks and Rec. That's what you were. You're talking about Parks and Rec. Here's her, here's her thing, and then I'm going to make a challenge. And I make a challenge at all these meetings, and I'm going to challenge you guys at this because I'm not going to let you walk away and say, uh, Commissioner, what can you do? Or Mayor, what can you do? Now I'm going to push back on a community just a little bit. And you may, you may, you may drag me out here, but I'm going to push back on a community a little bit. Just like this mom who said, you can do anything that you want to do, basically telling her child, you can do anything that you want to. Just like the parents that allow their kids to be out at 2 a.m. in the morning. You can do anything that you want to do. There is no rules. There is no rules. And the government has to take care of you. But, but these kids at some point in time were five years old. At some point in time, they were four, four years old. Those are angels. Those are not bad kids. They may be little rambunctious, but they're kids at five and four years old. And, and, and I get it that, you know, most people are not there to mentor a 17-year-old or to mentor an 18-year-old. But can anybody give up some time to impact a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old? See, here, this is, what, this is the other piece that you have to know. This is crime fighting for me here. And it's not, and when I came in here talking, this, people are saying, oh, he's soft. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He's soft. But here's the thing. I like to use my head a little bit. Here's the thing. If a kid of color, color or any kid, period, cannot read by the time they're in the third grade, the probability is that they will not graduate from high school. If you cannot read by the third grade, most likely you're not going to graduate from high school. And if you can't make a living a normal way, how are you going to make a living? You're going to sell drugs. You're going to do dope. You're going to steal things. You're going to burglarize. You're going to do everything that you can. And then you've got to carry a gun to protect you against the other guys who are trying to rob you and take the stuff from you. And it all started when you were five years old. We want to do some crime fighting. Everybody wants to get involved. The government's not going to save you from everything. That five-year-old reading to them, mentoring, giving some time can make a difference in the city of Baltimore. And so I challenge, I challenge us to do a little bit too. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> you beat me to it, Commissioner. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> All right, Deacon Bats. We <laughs> yes, ma'am. We have a question over here with Larry. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, my name is Terry Johnson. I live in the area. I'm also an employee here. Um, I. I have a question, maybe a comment about the um, the recreation centers. Back in the um, the 70s, late 70s and 80s, there was a program called the Ice Youth Incentive Entitlement Program, and I thought that worked well for the um, young adults. We were teenagers. Um, it used to be initially it was called the the 18 month program, and we worked after school for three hours. If you were um, an athlete, you worked later, like from six to nine or six to ten. And you earned, it was minimal wages then. And during the summer, you worked, you know, the summer program. Um, I worked in a recreational center, and we, we worked mostly with kids. So they weren't, um, let's say, uh, there was adults there also. During the summer, we, um, you know, they had the lunch programs. We did many things. They even had, like, uh, someone come in who was a beautician, learn how to do hair. We used to have gong shows, all types of things that was um, interesting, and we were interested from, let's say, from the five-year-old in the summer time, I mean, during the summer until, you know, 18, 19 years old, until you graduated. If you didn't do well in your school grades, then you may not have had that job. Um, but for me and many other people, that little bit of money meant a lot. You know, I think it prevented a lot of people from going out um, selling drugs because you Sometimes these people, some kids may just need enough money just to sustain them. They may want a nice pair of tennis shoes, okay, but they may not be able to get it, so they may have to go out in the street, you know, make whatever money they can. This was enough money to buy whatever you wanted, you know, I mean, reasonably. And I always wondered what happened. I know that the money wasn't there, but sometimes it is just worth going out and beyond to get something like that. I know the money isn't there. We ask the um, companies now to help and get blue chip or whatever to help do this during the summer. Youth work. But I think 
that sometimes that we may have to invest in that, take the money from someplace. You know, um, there are many older teenagers, once they're out there, they don't want that money. But if you can get them at an early age, you know, where they're making minimum wages enough, you know, I used to, I mean, you know, we used to pay our class dues. We wanted, we did everything. We learned responsibilities. Um, I didn't have to pay my parents any money, but it was like twenty dollars every two weeks. She would save it. My parents would save it for us on the side, just so that we would learn responsibility. This was the late seventies and the eighties. Thank but, you. But um, had I known, well, your question. I'm had sorry I known for the sake of that time. I was going to yes, speak ma'am. tonight that I would make this. Mm-hmm. I would have pulled up some stats because I think there are interesting stats that happen back then as far as um, the crime rate and those people who worked, who went on to college and on to work as opposed to going to jail. A lot of people I knew I did were, who lived in a projects, you know, in East, Southeast Baltimore. I'm North sorry, I'm a, I'm a, your question, just get it to, because for the okay, sake of time, there wasn't a question. we have several people. I just want to people. throw the information okay. out that maybe you can consider that. And we do, Ms. Johnson. I want to thank you for, uh, for coming out. Uh, it's called Youth Works now and the money oh, from in, in 2014 is different than the 70s, so the, pro- the program has changed. So right. the federal government, has the, that money for the employment project, employment program has, has dried up, but I made the commitment to continue to fund those programs. And that story that you told about what you did with your money, we have so many stories about young people that are using these youth work opportunities to do that exact same thing, and that's what fueled my commitment to continue to, to um, fund that program. And that's why when I pointed out Don Fry, um, that what the business community is doing is extremely helpful because it's given those young people who want to do better. They've been through the, pro- the youth works and worked for the city. They've worked out in the parks. They've worked in the rec centers. But they want to enhance their job readiness skills. The Hire One Youth Program is uh, a modern program for today's workforce that is really helping those kids. And that's why I pointed him out, because I'm very, very grateful. What you see from those programs or stories of today, young people that are doing that exact same thing, putting that money on to the side, finding their independence, finding their value, seeing that they can add, um, they can be productive members of society, finding out what they want to do with themselves. Because sometimes you can learn a lot in school, but you might not see yourself any of those things and the, pro, and the opportunities that, the, the, that they're getting from the uh, higher one youth employers, they're finding what they want to do with the rest of their lives. So we're on the same page. We, we need to continue to make sacrifices, which I did. You know, we did, you know, in, this, in some cases had to rob Peter to pay Paul to make sure we had all that money there for youth works, but that's there. And when we couldn't do any more, the, the business community has stepped up in a big way, and I want to thank them for that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilman Scott had his hand up. He wanted to also uh, chime in, Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, as the, the youngest elected official in the city and someone that was not that long ago a youth works worker, when I worked youth works, all we did was cut grass and make lunches. That's all we were able to do. But today, and actually today, the program that you talk about today still exists, but it exists in different forms. I actually came here from the Good Now uh, Pal Center that's still open, never closed. And all of the workers there that work with the young kids every day are young people from the neighborhood. And they paid through a wonderful program that we have called Civic Works. And we have that throughout different places throughout the city where we have these young people. They get paid to go to this place every day to work and be with those young people. So you have to look at it. For me, it has to be like a multifaceted approach. The program and Youth Works, actually, a lot of the kids still work year-round in their program as well. So those kind of programs are still going on. We just have to do a better job of highlighting them. Thank you, Councilman. Up front, we have a comment from uh, the CRC president. I want to make sure we get you in. And I just want to share, uh, we do, thanks to the president of the uh, uh, MedStar Good Samaritan, Madam Mayor, uh, we did promise to be out of this facility at a certain time. It is now, according to the clock, I have 841, uh, 8.45 is our cutoff time. We have several minutes. But I want to give the president of the CRC an opportunity to give his comment. Then we're coming to the gentleman standing to uh, behind Kevin. Yes, sir. Okay. One of the uh, comments I'd like to make was that uh, someone made a comment about the police officers uh, brutalizing the citizens. What most of you don't know in the Northeast, uh, internal affairs have two booklets to 
tell you how to file a complaint against an officer. And we had the complaint forms right up front. All you have to do is to go into the district, ask for a form. If you speak Spanish, they'll give you a, a booklet in Spanish. If you speak English, they'll give you the booklet in English, and it'll take you step by step. And we also have an officer there that can also assist you from internal affairs. Uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to add on that I think that the question wasn't totally answered. Uh, my question is, when will, we, when will we be getting new cars, more cars? And that is a good question. Uh, part of the thing that uh, we built into our negotiation uh, contract that was ratified is to uh, uh, have new cars because the way that we do the deployment, we're going to have more officers out uh, during the times of crime from uh, 4 p.m. to about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning. So we have so many officers during that time, we need more cars. And so as part of the contract, we have cars that were already uh, slated for replacement. And then we have another 130 cars that are slated to come in based on the contract. So we have more cars that are coming. Uh, this time we allow the officers to uh, get engaged and we ask them what type of cars that they want. We allow them to look at the cars and to, because uh, that's their office. That's where they are eight or 10 hours a day. So they're, they're picking out the cars. They're also looking at the color. They're also looking at the prototype and what that car is going to look like so they can take pride in the car. So we have them coming. They're on the way and hopefully they'll be here soon. Hopefully. And we will come to you. And we will come to you as soon as we come from this gentleman with this shirt and tie. Thank you. So now we're going to give the mayor and the commission the opportunity to respond. I think it's really important. To yeah, I think it's really important to look straight ahead and have these conversations because uh, there again, I work for you. You pay my salary uh, based on your tax dollars. And I, I was very, very clear at the beginning. I call strikes and balls. I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm not going to be any, hiding anything. I'm going to be transparent. Uh, when I when I uh, uh, came here and I landed uh, on a Sunday, when I came here to work and I landed on a Sunday. I was meeting with a family that next day because an event took place on Friday. So I met with that family right away. And what I was doing is setting a tone in this police organization to let people know, number one, I care about everybody in this city. I care about humanity. I care about life. I don't care what's going on. The life makes, makes a difference. You can hear it in me. When I'm talking here and I'm, I'm going a little, getting a little emotional, I'm not faking that. That means something to me. This is what I've been doing for 33 years, and we're going we're gonna to change and make a difference within the organization. When we have conflict, number one, Rodney Hill is a guy that I hired and brought in. He used to prosecute police officers, and I talked him into coming over to be in charge of internal affairs. So he's in charge of internal affairs. He's a fresh start. He's a good guy. He's solid. He calls balls and strikes. And so I bring him to these meetings. So number one, when we have complaints, he takes that information down, and he will follow up, and he will report out. 
When we have very confl conflictual situations that take place in the community that are very high profile, in, in order to be transparent, and I have to really applaud the West family because they truly are a tight family and they've been out and vocal for over a, almost going on a year. So I, so I applaud them and, and what they're doing. And, and they, they took me on early on and I paid attention to what they were saying. I listened to what they said and what the, what the, the, the emotions and the feelings that they were dealing with. And I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, kind of throw it to the side. Now what we've done to make sure that we're transparent is that we've brought in an outside task force of people that, that are not affiliated with us, have no connection to us, and what I have said to them is review this. And we brought in experts. People are her experts who will call balls and strikes and say, all I'm asking you to do is tell the truth. Good, bad, or different, all I'm looking for you is to tell the truth and tell it to the public. So we have put that task force together. Rodney oversees that. He's called, uh, how many is it, seven or eight? Six. Six experts together who will be coming forth, hopefully in a short amount of time, to do a report and share. And I'll like, there again, I'm not going to color what they're saying. I'm going to say, step up to that podium if it's, our, if, it's any, it's a, if it's our training, if it's something that officers did, or if the officers did the correct thing also, I just want you to tell the truth and be honest and come to that table. So we're not hiding from anything. We won't hide for anything. The thing with your son, we will look into that and we will review it. Review it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So we, again, thank you very much, Commissioner, for the response. I just want to say to uh, the family, I know that you've been at, the, at our um, public safety forums before. I just want to make it clear that I understand that you're grieving. We've talked. Uh, you know that, uh, you know, despite you all coming and yelling at me, you know that I'm the one that sat down and met with you. Um, you asked for a coroner's report, you know, the cor you, we've talked, you know, the coroner doesn't work for me, works for the governor, but I still reached out. I requested that that, re that coroner's report be done. You asked for an investigation. It wasn't done by the state's attorney. The only investigation is being done. It's being done at my direction, right? So I hear you, but we, and, and don't think that it's not at the front of my mind because we're working on it. So you know, I know that you continue to, to come to the, to, the, to the forums, and I know you feel like you're not being heard, but that's going up against the, the facts of the matter. We've met. We've talked. Even though the coroner didn't act, doesn't work for me, I, I work to get that report, and I'm investigating. We, and this, he still doesn't work for me. But the only investigation that's happening is happening in my, direct, is happening in my direction. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sir, you have the actual last question. Okay. But I just want to make sure, I, if, Madam Mayor, if I can just ask you this and, and go off rec, uh, go digress for a second. Uh, it was you and you alone who actually sent the letter and requested a coroner's report. Am I correct? And yes. that was without being asked. You did that because you wanted to get started. Start. We all want to get you to the, met with right. the family. And we want to get to the answers. Thank you. I just, and the corner does not work for you, Madam Mayor, but no. you're con continuing to be consistent with working on behalf of that, that issue. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joseph Ray, and I'll try to make it quick. I know that the police department can't do it all, and we all know that. My question is, and, 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 it's very important, and I'm not sure if I missed it. I came here kind of late. But my question is, how is the mayor's office, the police department, dealing with the uh, youth as far as mentorship? I know that's very, very important because you only have so many police officers. And I know growing up as a child, I'm from New York. I was raised on the streets of New York, so I've seen all types of violence, been on all sides of it. And I know for me, 99% of it because I didn't have the mentorship. I didn't have someone to take me by the hand and say, you know what, this is how you're supposed to do, this is what you're supposed to do. So my question is, and you know, I'm, I'm big in the church right now, and me and church members, we knock on doors and we spread the gospel, which is very successful, praise the Lord. But my, que amen. But my question is, from the city standpoint, from the mayor's office, what groups what things do you do from a civilian standpoint that reaches out to the young men? And I, I get the tweets from the Baltimore City's department and, and I hear all the bad news and I knew about this in New York when they said about Baltimore, but it's totally different than New York because y'all much smaller. But the question is, what are we doing to mentor? We have so many 
women, single women with these children, no fathers, and the violence, yeah, you may have police being violent, that's, that's, that's true, but 99% of the violence is black on black crime, with young men against young women, young women against young men, I see it, I read it, and I follow it every day throughout the world. Question, sir, I'm sorry, question. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, my question, yes, thank you very much. My question is, what groups, what do you have for mentorship, and are you uniting with the churches, because I think that would be a better step to, to help with neighbors and, and, and people going door to door to help these young men and young women that don't have well, I think you just took my playbook, and it's a good way for, I, for me to end the answer of my uh, last question real quick, because you kind of teed this up. Remember I told you where I came from, South Central Los Angeles? You may have seen movies about South Central Los Angeles at different times. You know, I wear this uniform because I was mentored by a police officer. I wear this uniform that someone took the time to touch me as a young man and say that you can become something. For me, it's becoming a police chief or commissioner in three different police departments in the United States, and that just that came from that police explorer program that I told you about. The reason I want to build that is because I'm a product of that. And where I came from, police officers were not looked upon very kindly. They were not liked. They were caught. There was words like pig, swine. You guys remember that from the 60s? Because I, I come from that generation. And so those those were the, those were those different names that were, were being called. But it was for that positive interaction that I have is where I wear that uniform today. And the reason I do what I do is because I want to make an impact on some young life that 33 years later they can say I met this police chief or commissioner that impacted my life that made, that made a difference. I talked about Explorer Camp because part of what we're doing is not just the sports, it's connecting with the relationships to do the mentoring. And that's what we're really trying to do. So when I talk about what we can do about five-year-olds, I'm not just talking, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And, and the business community, I need transportation to get those kids there. So if the business commu community wants to step up, I need to get, Mr. Fries, I need to do transportation to get my kids to the Explorer Camp. But that's what we're doing. And beyond just the camp, I'm trying to push for my officers to build that relationship to mentor. This young man here, I'm going to get out of the camera zone. You see him, if you follow me, you see him just standing around. He talks in his sleeve sometimes. He has this funny thing in his ear, and he just stands. You just think he's a weird dude. Just, he's just kind of hanging out there. This, this, this young man here, his name is Ryan. Ryan lives in a 100% African-American community. He chooses to live in a 100% African-American community that is struggling. He, when we go out on the street, young men come up to him all the time and say, Mr. Ryan, how you doing? It's good to see you. Shaking the hands, and they give, give a big smile. They give him a big hug. He's very active in his church. Church has to be, happens not to be Caucasian church, and he's giving to that community. He's mentoring. When I went to Frederick Douglass High School, one of the young men that, that I talked to got up, went over and shook his hand. I'm saying, how about me, man? I came to talk to you. And he walked past me to shake his hand. There's, no more, there's uh, many officers. You hear about some of these things that are going on, some true, some not true, but the things that, that you hear that are going on at different times, there's a lot of these police officers who give their time in football, give their time in basketball, mentor young kids. This young lady here, who is, who is my chief of staff, she has a young man that she's mentoring, a young man that had the opportunity to be a burglar, go other ways, and she has spent years and continues to spend time to get this young man on the right track. So we have programs, and we will continue to do those programs, but I think what you're saying, and I agree with you, is going to be those relationships on a different level, not only for the, the youth in the community, but also for my police officers, the more that we mentor. And I have to say hi to Councilman Mosby and his wife who just walked in. I forgot to mention them, so they just walked into the room also. Thank you. I know that, and just so we're clear, we're not going to get to everybody's question this evening. If you still have a question because we're past the time that we're supposed to be out, if you have a form, you can fill out the question, the question and we can get that answer for you or connect with, we'll have one of our Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods people connect with you and make sure that they follow up directly to get an answer. I'm a firm believer in, in mentorship. That's how I got where I am. I had, you know, a blessed with great parents, but also blessed with a lot of wonderful mentors, and I believe very strongly in it, and we work in partnership with um, mentoring uh, agencies, uh, not-for-profits in the community. Um, to that extent, I do want to uh, give the councilman, uh, Brandon Scott, an opportunity to speak on uh, his efforts with mentoring, and then I'll close out. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, mentor. The mayor is my mentor. Sir, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, 
mentoring is, is what actually is going to change our city. If, if some of you may have read a few weeks ago, I wrote an editorial in the Sun saying, where are the men? Well, all the men in the room that are not involved in the with the organization don't raise this, work for the city, please raise your hand. All the men, raise your hand if you don't work for the city. If you're not here for work, if you're here as a community member. Now, all the women, men, put your hands down. Now, all the women, put your hands up. You see the difference? That is the problem with our city. Men are not involved at the amount that women are. In the young, in the, especially in the lives of our young people. There are thousands of young men on mentoring waiting lists, and there are hundreds of thousands of proper, uh, proper men to give them mentorship. That is what's going to change our city. So, sir, what I challenge you to do is what my, my council colleague, Nick Mosby, we challenge people to do every day. If you're a man in the city and you're not mentoring a young man, if you're not spending some portion of your day to better the lives of young people in your neighborhood, to me, you already did. That you have to step up and do something. If the men in our city don't step up, if they don't mentor young kids, I probably have too many mentees, too many, more than I can handle. But we have to. We can't keep letting the women carry the weight, but we also have to in intercede in the lives of our young people. Only men can tell young men what it means to be a man. Only men can show them that. And we have to continue to show them that. Thank you very much, Councilman. I want to uh, thank the C Councilman uh, Mosby for, for being here as well and, and your wife for being here. I know that uh, Councilman Mosby had a pretty momentous, it's, it's, this week is Councilman Scott's week with the, with the curfew bill, but last week, for the beginning of this, if, uh, last week, last week, I signed, I signed his ban the box legislation that he worked very hard uh, for, so I want to thank him for his leadership there. Again, as we close, I just want to touch on a few key issues. First, thank you for being here. Second, I know that some of you are leaving without your questions answered. Again, you have the forms. We can follow up, and we have um, mayor's office and neighborhood staff people that, that uh, are available as, as we leave. They've raised their hands. Second, I want to uh, thank the elected officials who are here who've been working in great partnership uh, with me. Thank you to all the members of my team. What I forgot to say about Chief Ford, who's in the back you know, that uh, Commissioner Batts mentioned, is his commitment to making sure that the fire department uh, works aggressively to hire people from Baltimore. He's in Dunbar and Douglas, and he is committed to having what he calls feeder, a feeder team or a, what is it called in baseball? Farm team. Farm team. <laughs> so he wants to use the, the high schools to... Uh, find his future fire department employee, employees is a wonderful career and we all want more, uh, more firefighters from Baltimore. So if you have someone, young person that you think might be interested, Chief Ford, if you could raise your hand one more time. There he is in the back. Please uh, see him. Again, I want to thank you all for being here and I want to thank all of the staff uh, here at Good Samaritan for hosting us and making this uh, available. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here.